Romans chapter number 9. What about our readings like this? I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. And I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. separated from Christ for the sake of my brother and my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons in the glory and the covenants in the giving of the law in the temple services and the promises who are the fathers and, whom, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. I want to preach this morning from the subject, the whole of Israel. Genesis chapter number 12 marks the beginning of the history of the history between God and his chosen people, the Israelites. Genesis chapter 12. God calls a man by the name of Abel, whom he later names Abraham to leave the comfort of his father's house and travel or migrate to a land that he would show him. In obedience to Abraham's, or in obedience to God's instruction, Abraham was assured by God that Abraham would bear a son with his, with his wife, Sarah, despite the fact that Abraham's wife, Sarah, was incapable of having children. And although it would take God many years to give Abraham and Sarah the son that he had promised them, 
when they were well stricken in years, when they were well up in age, God was found to be faithful to his word in allowing Abraham and his wife Sarah to have a son whom Abraham named Isaac. From Isaac would come Jacob, and from Jacob would come the 12 tribes of Israel. And despite the fact that the nation of Israel would spend 400 years in Egyptian captivity, God, being faithful to his promise to Abraham, raised up a servant by the name of Moses who stood in the face of Pharaoh and boldly declared to let the people of God go. After a series of ten plagues, Pharaoh reluctantly let the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. Under the leadership of Moses, God led the nation of Israel to the prince of the promised land. Just when it appeared that God was going to fall short of his promise once again, through the death of Moses, God raised up another servant by the name of Joshua, who would lead the nation of Israel across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan that God had promised to Abraham. And it was there that when the children of Israel took possession of the promised land of Canaan, that they went into this downward spiral of rebelling against God, God sending them into captivity only to bring them out of captivity. This downward spiral of rebelling against God to go into captivity only for God to bring them out of captivity. And it is this downward spiral that transitions us to what we call the New Testament, where we find the children of Israel still not operating as an independent nation as God had created them to be, but we find them under the government of the Romans. They are that the children of Israel are under the government of the Romans that they await a Messiah who would deliver them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. And all their hopes and in all their expectations, they wait patiently. And when it seems that God is not going to follow through with his promise, God calls a little virgin girl by the name of Mary. And, and he impregnates her with the, by the power of the Holy Spirit to give birth to the Messiah that the Israelite nation patiently waited but when the Messiah shows up on the scene, instead of the nation of Israel being excited about the Messiah, they ask the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? They waited patiently for a Messiah, and now the Messiah has shown up on the scene in the vast majority of the Israelite nation reject the Messiah they had been waiting for. This is a sad scenery. It's a sad scenery to see the Messiah on the scene, but he's not welcome in his own house. It's a sad scenery to see oppressed people reject their Savior. It's a sad scenery to see a hungry person reject food. It's a sad scenery to see a naked person reject clothes. And it's a sad scenery to see the nation of Israel who are expecting their Messiah to reject him when he shows up on the scene. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, there are many people who instead of learning from the mistakes of Israel are following in their footsteps of rejecting the Messiah that God sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I know what you said. Who you talking to, Brother Reverend Pastor Preacher? We sit in the second half in Baptist Church. We've been saved, baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost. What do you mean the 
that there are many people that are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, every time you tell a lie, you are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time you commit adultery, you are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time you commit fornication or participate in homosexuality, you are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
controlled by the will of God. My conscience, Paul says, testifies with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, somewhere around verse 16. Paul declares there that a believer has the mind of God or the mind of Christ. Paul says, my conscience is a credible witness because I am a believer who has the mind of Christ. That means my thinking about what's right and wrong is in accordance with the way God thinks. Paul says, if you don't believe me that Jesus Christ is the God of Israel, you can ask my conscience in the Holy Spirit. Paul, what you talking about? What, what, do you, what, what, why are you telling me to ask the conscience? And, and, and why are you telling me that you're telling the truth? And, and why is it that you're telling me you're not lying? Lying about what? Paul answers. I'm not lying. Verse 2, that I have great sorrow. Not only do I have great sorrow, Paul says, I have unceasing grief. Where is it happening, Paul? Paul says it's happening in my cardia. Where cardia is the Greek word for heart. It's happening in my, my heart. Essentially, great sorrow and unceasing grief are essentially the same thing. Paul uses the words side by side here to emphatically express the pain, the emotional pain that he is experiencing in his heart. Your heart, ladies and gentlemen, is where all of your thoughts, emotions, and everything that there is to know about you is stored inside of your heart. Paul says, I have great sorrow and I have unceasing grief that's happening in my heart. The context of the scripture seems to suggest that Paul's use of the word heart is in reference to what he knows about Jesus Christ. He says, my knowledge about Jesus Christ, hear me, causes me pain. Hmm. This is where it gets interesting. My knowledge that Jesus Christ is the God of Israel causes me pain. My knowledge that Jesus Christ came to save those who are lost causes me pain. Why does it cause you pain? Why does what you know cause you pain? Paul says because my people won't accept it. Uh, Paul knows that Jesus Christ is the only way to go to God, but my people won't accept it in that curse. Paul's emotion is a very real emotion. It gives the sense of a very real Christian. Because a real Christian doesn't laugh when people are going the wrong way. A real Christian feels pain inside of their heart when they see people going the wrong way. A, a real Christian doesn't magnify sin, but a real Christian weeps when he sees a person going the wrong way. And I want to know, is there any real Christians in here who your heart goes out to those who are lost? Does your heart go out to those who you know are going the wrong way? Paul says, what I know 
but my people are rejecting that fight and it hurts me. Because I know that the only way to see God is by way of Jesus Christ. When they don't accept Jesus Christ, it hurts me. You 
Jesus Christ is the God of the universe. Secondly, you ought to hope in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel. The text says, verse number three, for I could wish that I were
six references that proved why Israel should have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. It starts off by saying in verse 4 that to them was given the adoption as sons. Several weeks ago, I explained to you the word adoption from the Roman perspective. We learn rapidly that in order to be adopted from a Roman perspective, the person that was going to be adopted had to be dependent. Paul says, to them, God adopted Israel as sons. And as a result of adopting them as sons, Paul says, God sprinkled them with his glory. Glory simply is a reference to the majesty of God. A beautiful picture of this is that of the prodigal son. The prodigal son leaves his father's house. He spends all of his money. He finds himself in the pig pen, eating pig slop. When the prodigal son comes back home, there's no shoes on his feet. But what does the daddy say? That's my boy. Put some shoes on his feet. When God adopted the children of Israel as his son, he sprinkled them with his majesty. In other words, they begin to look like the people of God. They begin to walk like the people of God. They begin to talk like the people of God. They should have known that Jesus Christ was their Messiah because God adopted them and shared with them a portion of himself. But not only that, God gave them the covenants, the Bible says. Covenants here refers to a united agreement. To give a person a covenant is to enter into a relationship with that person. And the signing of the covenant was God giving the children of Israel the Mosaic law. Paul is simply suggesting here that Israel should have known that Jesus Christ was their Messiah because they had everything that they needed to prove that he was indeed their Messiah. He adopted the sons. He sprinkles them with his glory. He gives them the covenant. He signs it by the Mosaic law. But not only that, he gives them the temple service. Temple service is simply the work of God. He gives them the work of God. He keeps them busy as they anticipate. It's in your Bible, the promises. God had promised them a Messiah. And he put them to work as they patiently waited the Messiah. And they had the law of Moses that told them everything that they should expect in the Messiah. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he is a perfect fit for what they are.
church, theologically speaking, is not a replacement of his bread. That's called replacement theology. That's not biblical. The Bible speaks about God raising up a nation that would provoke the nation of Israel to anger. That nation that, raised, that God raised up to provoke Israel to anger is both you and I, the church. But we can't overlook Israel because the, the, the Messiah came by the way of Israel. I remember seeing what all of them trying to tell you in the short time that we spent together is that you should hope in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the God of Israel. Not only should you hope in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the God of Israel, but you should hope in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel. If you ever been to Disneyland, you would know that Cinderella, my childhood girlfriend, has her own castle. If you ever been to Disneyland, you would know that Cinderella has her own castle. One day at Disneyland, Cinderella's castle was filled with children and their parents. They were just running around the castle sightseeing, looking at this and looking at that. But all of a sudden, all of the children rushed to one side of the castle. You guessed it. Cinderella herself had walked in the room. How I wish I was there. She walked in the room flawless. And all the kids circled around her just to touch her and to have her touch them. Lord, I wish I was there. And she's touching the kids and allowing the kids to touch her. One side of the room has become empty except for a seven to eight year old little boy. I say seven to eight years old because his age could not be determined because of his deformity. He was a very deformed little boy and he was standing on the opposite side of the room holding the hand of his big brother. He wanted to be around Cinderella, but he did not want to approach her because he did not think Cinderella, as flawless as she was, wanted anything to do with him. But to his surprise, Cinderella made her way through the crowd. And she found the deformed little boy that was on the opposite side of the room and Cinderella leaned over and put her flawless lips on that little boy's deformed face. His older brother was happy. He just knew this was going to cheer his little brother up. But to his surprise, after Cinderella kissed the deformed boy and left, he looked
ladies and gentlemen, you should hope in Jesus Christ because he is the God of Israel. He is the Messiah of Israel who came to take away the sins of the world. And for everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, you get to live eternally with God. Amen. May God bless you. May God keep you.